breakfast. Breakfast. Good break. So now what I would like to do is, is begin to talk a little bit more about that thing that many people said was so essential, which is how to write a good warm-up question. Um, and and um, I'll show several of your, your answers. But um, I'm also told that we have some people have come from the university's uh, technology support. And they'll see a little bit of this workshop. And then uh, we'll be able to talk later about how to implement just in time teaching in the systems that you use. This is called dot, dot learn or dot learn. So, so, some program that your students are already registered in. So, so that will be very interesting. Uh, so, so a good warm up question. Uh, here's, here's one of your answers. And you can read it. Uh, read here. Uh, here's I think this is a, this is an excellent answer. Um, this touches very quickly on many of the most important points. Um, that of course is based on the reading. And that the questions are open-ended and possibly ambiguous. So students can write many different things and it will give you more insight into how they're thinking about the subject. Then if the, if the question is very straightforward, then they can give you an answer if it's, if it's very simple, then you don't find out how they're, how they're thinking about it. Um, it's motivating and, and just challenging enough to test students' understanding. Um, it, it could be not, not necessarily just factual, it could be a concept map, it could be many, many things. Oh, okay. So perhaps I'm, I'm mixing, sorry. So there, there are three answers in your sphere, and I've given um, some of that background to all of them. Okay. But I'll, I'll give you a moment to read. These are all very good answers from you. So, so many new possibilities here in your answers, and I think now I will, uh, yeah, so, so we've reached, we reached the point where we can start thinking about writing a warm-up exercise. I think I had one slide out of order here, I'm not sure how I did this, but, but here is another answer of yours that I'd like you to read, this is again from one of you. Then 
don't show everything here. They have been deeply challenged and, and thinking deeply about the problem. Uh, but it's okay. This goes back to that slide that I had earlier, which you raised a great deal about whether it's important to use the answers in the class or whether it's important to students prepare, etc. Um, I would say, like any just in kind of teaching, like any method of teaching, you can get better and better slowly at it. Just as it is for your students to, to begin to learn your subject. Um, you don't have to be a master after the first day or even after the first semester. It's just something to keep working on and trying and improving. And this is this is the perfect goal. So in a little while, I'll just read this. In a little while, we'll do a group exercise. But for now, I want to give some ideas. Okay, these are some suggestions. Now I'll have a handout that has these things and more on the back of it. And it's sort of a form to help guide you in writing, um, writing a, a warm up question, a warm up assignment. So these phrases, explaining your own words, or how would you describe, these are signals to a student that you're not looking for them to just give you some facts. Because if you ask, um, you know, what is the definition of something, some technical term, they will look it up in the book and type it out for you, as if the goal of the question was for you to find out from them the subject which you already know. But that, of course, is not the point. The point is for them to think and to describe in their own words. Um, sometimes I find it's even useful to suggest that students write an explanation as if it was for a younger student. Or write the explanation that they would give if they were explaining this idea to you know, their grandmother or to their grandfather, some person that they meet uh, in a cafe. It's not a student of, of science or engineering at all. But how would you explain this idea to a, an amateur? Um, they don't have to have a clear answer, we already said that. And, and I would say, this is part of learning to be a scientist or an engineer, is to define a question well. This is something we all know as, as professionals, is sometimes the world brings us a question which is not well defined. And I think it's a good thing to tell your students this, that when they become a professional, they will need to, this is part of their job as a scientist or an engineer, to take a question which is not well defined and make it well defined. You may have to go back and forth with a collaborator or a client and say, okay, is this what you want? Is this what you want? I can't do what you asked. It's too loose. This is tight. What, you know, is this what you need? Uh, so it's, it's good for them to learn that skill. The other thing is sometimes, and this is especially useful, yes? Uh, can we have that microphone? This is good, this is my first interruption. Thank you. <laughs> to win, to win a prize. I only have a prize.
and I will say this again later, that almost anything that you do with the students, I would explain it to them. So, um, there are some things that, of course, they should realize that it's a great training, but I think it's not necessarily um, important to, to force them to, to realize everything, because if they don't, then it just causes them frustration. So, when I, I will explain on the first day of class many things that I'm doing. Uh, just in time teaching is one of them, the using of clickers and peer instruction is another. Uh, how they do their labs um, and how the course is organized, when the exams will be. I tell them that I owe them an explanation that what I do in class, I think it may just be a loose connection, it's just a loose connection. Um, they step if I if I move it to a different spot, I won't keep bumping it with my elbow. Maybe that's better. Um, so I explain on the first day of class everything that I do, and I tell them I do these things to help you become a better scientist or a better engineer. I'm on your side, and if ever you feel like you don't understand why I'm doing something, or you think that something is not helpful to you. You ask me and I owe you an explanation. Uh, I think it's very important to earn the students' trust. Um, I'll talk about this more later, but, but yes, I, I think at this point it's very it's fine to explain to them that the questions are sometimes a little open and that they should write what they think is important. Okay? Alright. So, uh, and this last, this format, I was going to say, particularly if you have a large class and you want to have some statistics to understand how your, what your students are thinking, you know, it might be that there's a question and the choices are A, B, C, D, E, um, but then you have a box that says, please explain why you made the choice you did. That way you get both the open-ended thinking process and also, um, you can say, okay, 60% of you chose B, and 30% of you chose C, and 10% of you chose A and B. Uh, so, maybe now with the voting cards again, we can, we can see which of these is best. So, we have some mathematics questions. I had some specific requests. Please show me how this works in that time. So I'm trying, at least a little bit, from a physicist's point of view, to get a touch of the math. So the choices are A, evaluate sine of x and cosine of x for these values of x, i over 6, i over 3, etc. Choice B would be how are the sine and cosine functions defined? Choice C would be how would you explain the idea of a periodic function to a smart 10-year-old student? Uh, or D, what is the difference between amplitude and period? So, let's have a vote on this. One, two, three, vote. Okay. I'm seeing changing their minds rapidly. Um, good, okay. So I think there's enough divergence in the room, enough differences of opinion, to ask you to go ahead and discuss this and convince the people around you of your choice.
you know, it's a fine question. I like C better because it's a little more open. But how would you, for instance, not someone can suggest a way to rephrase choice D, which, which is an issue that students will sometimes get confused when they're first learning about these functions. How would you rephrase that so it's an even better warm-up question? Does someone have an idea? Define. Define. He has an idea. This is for this palabra. So, Professor, can you repeat your question, please? Yes, so my question is, so choice B says, what is the difference between amplitude and period? Which I think is a pretty good question, but could be made even better a little more flexible for students to answer. Um, so I'm asking if, if someone would suggest a way to rephrase this question that would be more in the spirit of a warm-up question, more opening one of the mathematicians perhaps who really struggles with students on these things, or a physicist who teaches about waves. So, uh, maybe if you just, we don't have the microphone. Um, tell me what. Oh, good. Okay. Send it here. Send it here. Cuando 
o no tienen un problema que no tiene solución, no se adaptan, no se queda con que sea una solución logística. And then, obviously, some shaking. Okay, so good. Same. And then, what is the 
what is the variable for work, W, and to say they're doing the corresponding amount, that means they have equal sign. So now I have Q plus W or Q minus W, and, if I, and, and the temperature will not change. Well, if I subtract them, then something is zero. Well, what's zero? It's the change in the internal energy total is zero, and now according to this first one, if the change in internal energy is zero, then it's not, then, then the temperature won't change. So now I can put these two things together, and from their work, I have the first law of thermodynamics. The change in energy is equal to heat minus W, and for the, um, for an ideal gas, that means the temperature won't change, so for an isothermal process, then these things are equal, and I have a whole lot done that I could have done from my own books. But as you've experienced yourselves today, it's better if it's experienced from the students more. And they answer this question, I get some very good answers. Students are essentially understanding the first law of thermodynamics pretty well from the reading, and then you can go deeper in class. You can also find some things like this next answer, which I'll share. So this one says, it's possible to add heat to an ideal gas without its changing its temperature by the gas receiving the heat and the atoms of that gas getting excited enough to disperse that heat as fast as they receive it. Now, if you're confused, this is not the responsibility of our, our interpreter, who's excellent. In fact, it's the student who's confused. This answer makes almost no sense at all. In English or in Spanish. It doesn't make sense in any language. The student has a problem, which I would identify after reading many of these answers to this question and other questions, is quite common among students who are just learning physics. And this is something that I've learned about my students from doing just in time. And that is that they believe that um, the speed of a process is somehow important, even when the process to you or to me is a steady state or equilibrium kind of process. They think if you do something fast enough or slow enough, sometimes nature can be fooled and the rules that they're learning don't apply. And this is, this is something that we need to bring out from them and, and help them to understand, okay, sometimes there are some processes where the speed is important. Other times there are processes where the speed is not important. And sometimes there are processes where the speed is important, but we're taking a particular um, uh, assumption about the speed, and we're doing it slowly, or we're doing it rapidly, and it's important for you to understand that the assumption that we're making fixes the answer in some way, to be you know, one way or another. So you can reduce their confusion about that speed of the process. Here's another example, and I, again, I tried converting this one to, to Spanish, so that you could, oh no, I'm sorry, this is the same example. Um, was it, I think, was it good enough? Do I need to show it at the end of my book? Or should I skip? I'll skip. So these were, these were the three answers. So now I've just put up some mathematics questions. Some of these were written by colleagues of mine who are in mathematics, and some were written by me based on what mathematics physicists often need students to use in various classes. So this first one, this is one from a colleague of mine teaching an introductory level uh, class. If a function has an inverse and is an increasing function, can you determine if the inverse is increasing or decreasing? Explain. So that's, that's one. Here's another one, also from the same person. Uh, why does a single point have many representations in the polar coordinate system? So these, I think, are both good 
good choices on um, intro level or maybe first semester of calculus classes. Um, this next one, this is clearly uh, sort of a mean value theorem question. Uh, explain why if a car travels 180 kilometers in 1.5 hours, then the speedometer must have read 120 kilometers per hour at least one square of the trip. And then as a follow-up question, can we guarantee that it will be 12 kilometers per hour during the trip? Some students, I think, will find, um, oh, all right, let me not say it. Let me not take my hand. Uh, I'll read this last question first. This is one of mine. This is based on you know, what physicists often mean. What does it mean for two functions to be orthogonal? Why is it useful for us to have sets of orthogonal functions? So this is, this is maybe a little higher level. Uh, but very necessary for a mathematical physics class, or quantum mechanics, or any, any class where we're expanding a function in terms of uh, some, some set of functions. Um, I'd like to come back to this one. Can we guarantee that it will be 12 kilometers per hour during the trip? What kinds of, do, do people have, particularly the mathematicians, have you had experience with students having a problem with this idea? Today, is, is the mean value theorem something that you find they get easily, or something that they find more difficult? Any the mathematicians wanted me to hit on their subject, so now I'm, I'm turning it back to them. Um, so let me ask the question. If anyone wants the microphone, we can bring it. What answers do you think students would give to this question? You'll be asking questions like this a lot. Later. Any ideas what students would say? survive. The weak will die out because they will not recover. But this is, this 
this is actually a very common misconception. And this is why she asked this question. Um, Oh, this student is cracked. How, 
how could this be? He said, well, let's look at another one. After reading chapter 1 in the book, I would guess the substance is water in the form of a solid because the atoms are in order. However, I could be wrong because I think the atoms in a solid might be closer together. And there are many, many other answers like this. This guy had about 400 students in his class. And there were 40 or 50 like this. Maybe more. So, so this is a common error. And so I ask you, this is teaching us something. This is teaching us something about our students. So why are these two answers? You know, why, why do we understand this so easily and the students don't? The answer is because a thing like this, you know, everyone here knows that you're not supposed to think about the size of the dots. You're only supposed to think about the different patterns and how they're arranged. You're not supposed to think about the size. And the reason that you're not supposed to think about the size is because it's a cartoon. It's not an accurate drawing. It's a cartoon of, of that at the sub-microscopic level. But when did you learn that? Who told you that a drawing like this is a cartoon and not a realistic drawing? I have no idea when I learned that you're supposed to think of a thing like this as a cartoon. I just don't know. Somehow, when I was young, maybe in high school, maybe in the beginning of college, I just got it that, that this was the kind of thing that people draw and you weren't supposed to think about all the different aspects. You're just supposed to think about dark and light or open and closed and how the arrangement and you're not supposed to think about the subtle subject. I don't know how I learned it. And probably the people here don't know when they learned that either. But, again, you became the professors. That's one of those hidden skills that got you here and leaves some of your students struggling. So the reason I bring this up is again to show that when you do just-in-time teaching, when you ask these open-ended questions, Sometimes you find out things that you weren't even expecting. And this is a good example of something that, that this guy was not expecting this answer to be a problem. He was, he was looking for something else. But this turned up. And he was like, oh, so this is something my students need to be shown. When I do a drawing like this, don't worry about the size of the things. And I think that's true in general. Physicists do this often. We draw electric fields or magnetic fields, and we're drawing field lines sometimes, or we're drawing arrows, um, and, and those are different visual representations of a vector field, which is actually quite an abstract structure. And we're sketching something, and sometimes we mean for students to pay attention to the lengths of the arrows, and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we, we draw field lines, and you know the, the magnitude of the field is represented in some other way by, by the packing of the field lines, and sometimes it's not. And sometimes we're accurate in one way, and sometimes we're accurate in another way. Now, our students don't always know what part of the drawing is meant to be precise, and what part of the drawing is meant to be ignored. So the conventions that are commonplace amongst when we, when we work amongst ourselves as professionals, the students are just learning those conventions. And you need to be more explicit about telling them what parts of the drawing are real and what parts of the drawing are fake, uh, uh, cartoon. Okay. So here's another question for you to vote on. Ah, there's, there's a question over there if we can get the microphone. Um, Where's the microphone with the top right? Okay, just pull it up right. That's it. Professor, ¿tiene que ver el estilo de impartir lecciones de cada uno de los profesores para que el estudiante pueda llegar a un concepto más claro del tema? A clear 
And, the, and we chose that word when we first were thinking about just in time teaching. We chose that word very carefully. And we chose it with the implication that it's something that's not too difficult. It's not an actual strenuous activity of a contest. It's, it's something that you do to prepare for that strenuous activity in order to not to, to be able to perform at your best and also to avoid an injury. So that's really what the warm-up implies, is, is to help you do better and to avoid getting hurt. Uh, my colleagues at the Air Force Academy chose to call it a different thing, and this again shows the flexibility of the technique. Many of their students want to be pilots. They will not all be pilots, but, but they, that's what mostly they want to be, because that's the most prestigious thing you can do in the Air Force. So they call it pre-flight check instead of warm-up exercise. Now, I want to point out to you that there are archives of some warm-up questions. You don't need to write this all down. If you want to take a picture of it, that's fine. But as I said earlier, if you got the one URL from the very beginning, then that has the link to these slides so you can find all this stuff. And it also has direct links to these links. So, so you can find these um, online. I, I will apologize and say that the, this first one is much better. There's more stuff there for the physicists. There really is essentially the entire undergraduate curriculum. There are warm-up exercises for the introductory physics class, for modern physics, for quantum mechanics, for upper-level electricity and magnetism, uh, analytical mechanics, also for mathematical methods class, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. It's all there. Um, for mathematics, there's two semesters of calculus there, uh, and that's, it, it's, it's not as dense, but there's, there's a bunch of questions to get you started. Uh, same with chemistry, there's really just the first semester of general chemistry. Um, and then biology also, there's, there's a couple of classes there. There's also in this, uh, this stands for just in time teaching, DL is digital library. So that's a searchable thing that has some other fields of study as well, as well as some more mathematics and chemistry that are in these things. So there's, there's a fair amount there. But what I would encourage you to do is look at the questions that are there and then take those as guides. You can always improve upon them if you think that they're not quite what you want. None of this is carved in stone. You can always take the ideas of just the time of teaching, the warm-up questions, the other faculty, and improve on them. Make them your own stuff. Uh, a colleague of mine once said something that I think was very useful, which is that these ideas like just in time teaching, uh, peer instruction, or peer led team learning, or these people who do research on how students learn, what are the common misconceptions in different fields, etc. This is the science. And when you go into your classroom with your students, that's the engineering. So that's when you build the thing that actually suits the exact problem that you have that semester with your students. So you take the science that we have and do the engineering for your students. Okay. So what we this now brings us to the point where I think we can do that exercise. And this will take us, what time do we have uh, the lunch schedule? Monica? Monica? 12? Okay. So I think what we'll do is we'll get started on this. And what I'll do is I'll give you so much to do some work. And I'm going to give you a handout to do this. And then after lunch we'll have a discussion of what you did. So, uh, you know, are you the IT group here? The, uh, so, well, everyone, I think this is enough for you to everyone to have anyway. If you would just... Just 
take one and pass the pile, then everyone will get one of these sheets. So let me explain what this exercise will be. So, what we're going to do is I want everyone to think for themselves what class you're most likely to teach in the fall, next, next year. What class will you be most likely to teach? Then, uh, Mark, is that the second set? Yeah, these are for tomorrow. These, these are for later. Thank you. Yeah. But these are duplicates of others. So, uh, so, what you do, figure the course you'll, you'll teach next year, and then you're going to use this sheet. This is a guide to help you write a new warm up assignment. So, we'll have until lunch. You just sit quietly. You can talk to the people around you if you want, or you can just do this on your own. But, but use this as a guide. The first thing it does, it just asks you your name, what university this is, what academic discipline you're in, and then it gets more specific. So what course you're thinking about teaching, and then a specific day. Think of one day in that class where you know you're doing something different, something difficult for students. And there's a place to fill in what are the most important ideas on that day, and what are the new terms, the technical words, the jargon that you will introduce that day, and what are the most important skills that your students should be gaining on that day. Then, on the back, on the first page, no, 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 it's on the second page. Oh, I see, this is just copied on three pages. On mine, it's on the back. There's, there's um, some suggestions for how to form good questions. And there's many possibilities. You can choose among these whatever you think is suitable for you and your students. Um, the back page is an example of one already filled out for uh, an astronomy class just so you get a sense of what I'm looking for. So, spend a half an hour, fill out this thing, keep hold of yours, then we'll have lunch, and afterwards, we'll have some structured discussions of, of how to, you know, how to do it on these, and how to make them better. Okay, so you have 30 minutes now, and then we eat.
But before we, we go on to me, I thought I would just give you a little preview of what will happen after. So after lunch, um, we'll have some discussions. And you can start this discussion over lunch if you like, that's fine. Uh, the main idea is, again, to get into some deeper discussion about how these questions are structured and how to make them the best questions so that you really get what you want out of your students. So this is my rough idea for how to do this, but we can adjust. What I was thinking was that first what you would do is pair up with someone else that's in your subject area, in your academic discipline. And talk for a few minutes about what those questions are that you came up with, whether they are good questions, whether the answers that students will give you will be what you're looking for. And then also to, to pair up with somebody from a different subject area. Because sometimes our degree of expertise gets in the way a little bit, and if you feel like you've seen it all, you know all the issues that students have, and actually, you, you will be surprised at what answers your students will give. And one way to see that is to just see what answers somebody, you know, who's a chemist will give to a physicist, or a mathematician will, will get, give to a biologist or an engineer, or whatever. So, a little discussion with, with people who are outside of your field will also be helpful. And then what I'd like to do is, is collect some of these things together, and maybe we can uh, have, have them read to me so I can understand, and then share it with you. And then we can have a larger group discussion of you know, how these, these uh, questions will work, how they will work with students, and what kinds of answers students will get. And then we'll have a few more a little discussion about uh, what to do next. And then I'll have some more presentation. And then later on, we'll have some more, more of this sort of work. And then tomorrow, we have some people coming from your um, information technology group who will demonstrate the system that you already have on campus that could be used to implement the warm-up questions. And I will also do a demonstration of how this could work using uh, Google Forms. I also will, will experience a demonstration of this because I have just a couple of warm-up questions for tomorrow morning, which you can answer tonight. Uh, also using Google Forms, I'll give you uh, a URL that you can go to. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get it distributed by email easily, but somehow or other we'll find a way to point you to these questions that you can ask. And then I'll show you what the format of the answers looks like. Because uh, one of the things that you'll see as you use this is that getting students to ask, answer the questions is only half the process. The other half of the process is how you, as the instructor, view their answers. Because whether it's easy or difficult or time consuming can depend very much and just how much clicking you have to do going back and forth, or if you can get everything all in one place at one time, how you uh, connect the answers that, you, that your students give, and any points that you put uh, for them in a grade book, whether you do that online or not. So some of these technology things can make it easier or more difficult to, to implement. And uh, again, depending on whether you have a very large class or a smaller class, what tool you use may depend on what's easiest for your particular circuit. So um, with that, I think I'll stop. We can go on to lunch and have a nice break and uh, discuss what we've been doing. I'll be around um, and uh, if people want to Ask me questions, uh, try to understand, and we'll have some the, the uh, interpreters will still be here. You can ask me any questions, talk about anything related to, to just time teaching or teaching in general. Very good.